Good morning. You are warmly welcome to Nordea's webinar on Latin America's current status and outlook for the region. My name is Petri Karhapä from Nordea Trade Finance Sales, and I'm the moderator in this webinar. Uh, international trade represents a key element in Latin America's economic growth and uh, facilitates the industrialization there. As we know, coronavirus cases have been rising sharply in many Latin American countries. We hope that we can help you to navigate in this challenging environment. Our agenda today has four speakers. We start with update on Latin America with focus on Brazil, Argentina and Cuba by Amy Chuang from Nordea Macroeconomic Research. We continue by Jesper Fredriksen from Nordea's International Banks Unit. He will give an update on the region from a banking perspective. He will be followed by Peter Klang from Nordea Trade Finance Bank Management Unit. And Peter will give a comparison between Latin America and other regions. And then Jana Polsenova from Nordea Markets will tell us how to avoid trapped cash and uh, which solutions could be applied for that purpose. At the end, we have a short Q&A session. We kindly ask you to provide your questions via the chat box on your screen during the presentations. We will reply to questions uh, at the end of the webinar. If some questions cannot be answered online, we will revert to respective questioner after the webinar. But now, let's start. So, Amy, please. Thank you. Um, Latin America, on the next slide, I'll go uh, right in. I uh, have around 10 minutes to cover a little bit broad uh, aspect on the macroeconomic situation in uh, in Latin America. Uh, on this slide, you will be able to see that Latin America has really become the new epicenter of the COVID-19. And uh, right now, there are close to 1.5 million cases and still and the number of new cases that are still rising every day. Brazil accounts for about half of these cases and is currently the country with the second highest reported case in the world. And I've seen some different kind of estimates done by academia and independent researchers who suggest that the, the, the real number of cases and in also the real number of deaths are much higher than what is being reported. I guess that can be the case mostly in the EM space, but in Latin America, that seems to be a very severe. So, so the COVID-19 crisis has really hit Latin America quite severely right now. And many, many Latin American countries have imposed lockdown measures and can expect their economies to contract this year, probably more deeply than what they experienced during the financial crisis in 2008. And, but the, that's what you can see on the right-hand side uh, chart on this page. But the worrying part is that here I have shown you the uh, GDP numbers for Q1 2020. Not all countries have, have published the data yet. So Uruguay and uh, Argentina are still waiting for the numbers to be published for the Q1. But the worrying part is really that I've shown you the Q4 last year number. And there you can see actually uh, quite a few of those countries experienced a negative growth already in uh, Q4 last year. That was before the corona hit. And that's actually a trend that we have observed several years that, that uh, several Latin American countries have struggled with growth even before this crisis. And that is due to partly domestic policies, but also the trade war between the US and China that has lasted um, between 2008, uh, 2018 and then uh, earlier this year. So, so basically you can say quite a few of those Latin American countries enter this COVID-19 crisis in, in a pretty already uh, weak standing. So that is a worrying part. And on the next slide, you will be able to see that, well, low growth is nothing new to Latin America. In fact, the region has been stagnating for decades um, that you can see quite clearly on this chart. Here, I'm trying to show you 
the income level per capita in other region, which is measured by GDP per capita. And I try to make it comparable across region by comparing them to the US GDP per capita. And, and here the history goes way back. So here I showed you the history of 120 years. You saw that the Latin America actually start, had a very good starting point at um, 1900. Uh, had a much higher income level compared to Central and Eastern Europe and Asia and of course also Africa. But during the past century, uh, the, the growth has not really been performing. And by uh, during the last 20 years, Latin America as a region as a whole has clearly been uh, outpaced by uh, Central and Eastern Europe and, uh, and Asia. And I think that is a concern because over such a long time, you cannot just say that it was due to one crisis or a second crisis, but it's, it's a general economic pattern, probably more fundamental reasons that is standing behind. Uh, so, so, and that's what is really interesting. And then on the next slide, I want to show that there is a positive correlation between a country's GDP per capita or income level and the country's openness, which is in this case, I want to measure it by uh, export share of GDP. So basically when we see there's a quite clear positive correlation and also you see on the top right corner, you see a lot of those uh, Central Eastern European countries, actually a lot of those countries have become a part of Eurozone um, since then. And that really shows the experience from Europe and Asia is that when you see a rise of exports, especially as a share of true GDP, you will um, see the, the income level following that. And actually, uh, you see that on the chart, I'll try to show you uh, marked the Latin American countries in red. And you see Chilean as actually the country that has the highest GDP per capita among those Latin American countries I have selected. And, uh, and uh, it also has a, a relatively high export share. And Mexico has a very high share uh, of exports, but its domestic economy is pretty inefficient. So that explains why it's not the country with the highest income level um, per capita in Latin America. So, so it clearly shows that the Latin American countries need to boost exports. And, uh, and also we see that Brazil and Argentina are very uh, close economies and they have struggled uh, for years to lift the overall income level. So there is really a way to, to kind of boost your GDP and, and the income level in the country and that is to become more open and, and to drive more exports. Um, and how to do that? On the next slide you'll be able to see that um, here I try to look at the angles from the composition of the export Actually, compared to emerging Europe and Asia, Latin America uh, has been mainly exporting commodity exports. But also, if we look in very particularly at travel service exports, um, they are also very high compared to Europe and Asia. Uh, and that makes them quite vulnerable uh, to a global recession and especially uh, the current crisis where the service sector, particularly travel and commodities have been hard hit. So, so that's why Latin America it was kind of uh, expected to be hard hit by the corona crisis, even without they were seeing uh, rising cases of the virus. Uh, and then that also shows that they need to diversify their exports. They need to probably to export more manufactured goods. That could minimize the risk of being vulnerable to a global recession when nobody travels and, and the commodity demand um, or commodity prices start to plunge. So, so on this slide, you can see that on the left-hand side, I try to compare across regions how big the manufacturing sector is in each country or each region in this case. Um, and, and Latin America has a very small manufacturing sector compared to Europe and Asia or emerging Europe and Asia. So boosting the manufacturing sector is necessary to, to diversify exports as I mentioned, but also it could have some other benefits. It could lift the wage level and thereby the standards of living. And thereafter, you can create a pos uh, the, the positive effect is to create a middle class and, um, and which Latin America is actually lacking. Brazil, uh, Mexico, those are countries where the income inequality is quite big. You have maybe a lot of the wealth concentrated in the top five to 10% of the income groups. 
and then you have a lot of the poor but you don't really have a solid middle class that we have for instance in a lot in the in the advanced economies and having a middle class is good because then you can slowly and gradually create the middle class we always demand um, private consumption could become a, a solid driver of growth and thereby you also minimize the your your kind of vulnerability to uh, to a global recession um, so so there are many uh, benefits by uh, boosting uh, from boosting a, a manufacturing sector um, and uh, Latin America actually has a relatively young labor force which means that it is typically cheaper than compared to the economies in uh, emerging markets that have an older population, for instance, China. So we know that demographic patterns, as well as many other factors are making labor costs and uh, production costs generally in China has been rising for years. So there are a lot of motivation for companies to reallocate their production out of China. In fact, this trend started several years ago, but that's only being speeded up by the Corona crisis, by the trade war with the US. So, so many companies are, global companies are asking, where can we produce next? Many of those companies have relocated uh, production to Asia, um, Southeast Asia, but that destination is not without kind of problems as well. So, so that Latin America could definitely given the, the uh, relatively la uh, low, cheap, uh, lower uh, labor cost, could definitely become an attractive uh, destination, but a few criteria need to be fulfilled. The countries need to invest more, particularly in infrastructure. And here you can see on this slide, on the right-hand side, uh, the investment as a share of um, uh, economy is also very low in Latin America. Basically, they haven't been in investing enough. Infrastructure is very poor in that region compared to uh, Asia, compared to emerging Europe. So logistics is a very obvious place to start. You can have the production there. Companies can start to build factories. But if you don't have proper roads and rail facilities, how can you transport those goods out of the factories and to the end consumers? So that is very crucial. And of course, other crucial criteria uh, are better business environments, uh, overall security, so low crime rates. That's something that Latin American countries have been struggling with. And they need to, of course, um, do better improve on these areas before uh, they can really um, attract um, investment and, and, uh, and become, have bigger, bigger uh, production levels. So on the next slide, you'll be able to see the trade uh, with the Nordic, given that we, we know that the obvious path to boost growth is to boost manufacturing exports. Um, and uh, and uh, several of the countries have also actually hinted over the past few years that they want to do so. Um, and, and one way to do that will of course mean that they will first to see their imports rise. Um, they need to import machineries, uh, import um, you know, equipments in order to build and, uh, and invest in infrastructure uh, domestically. So, so, and if we look at how the Nordic companies and Nordic countries can exploit that potential um, and, and uh, to look at uh, the trades we have. So far, Latin America accounts for a very small share of export from the Nordics. Uh, it's, yeah, around 2%, uh, actually for Norway, it's even less than 2% of the overall exports from the Nordic countries that goes to Latin America. So there's definitely room to grow. The Nordic countries export mostly machinery and equipment, as you can see on the right-hand side, actually for Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, about half of the exports to Latin America are um, machinery and equipment. So that is basically already happening that we are exploiting this opportunity um, to, to actually, and that kind of exports will only grow if the Latin American countries choose to take advantage of this trend of a global supply chain diversification from China. And, and therefore they will want to invest more in infrastructure. They will want to invest more in, in, uh, in manufacturing and they will see them importing more machinery and equipment from among, the, among other countries, the Nordic ones. Um, and my last slide, I just want to show you how the Nordic countries um, kind of are exporting yet. So far, um, the biggest destination in Latin America for the Nordic countries are Brazil and Mexico, but they're probably because they are 
um, the biggest economies in Latin America. I think in the future, countries with the right mix of policies to promote manufacturing investment will likely to see the biggest jump in imports from the Nordic. And uh, so far, it's too early to say. Um, the political uncertainty is very high in Latin America. And, uh, and uh, right now, of course, the focus are all to fight uh, the corona crisis. But uh, given that many countries have launched some fiscal um, stimulus, not only to give like, for instance, cash rebates to companies and persons, but also to allocate more for investment. So there is some uh, opportunity, but, um, but it really depends on how the political wind is blowing in Latin America. And that direction can change very swiftly. So, so one way to look at what good opportunities from which country, and that is really to, to kind of follow the political um, direction. So um, I think that's all from me. Thank you very much, Amy. Let's move on to, to Jesper. So Jesper, please. Yes, good morning all, uh, and I'm very happy to join here. Um, the first slide I want to show you is uh, where Nordea is present in the, in the world, and uh, I think you are seeing the, the picture on the screen now. Um, we, of course, in the day are very committed to supporting our customers, especially in trade finance, of course. And uh, this picture here shows you where we are present and where we can support you. In the countries that where, where we are not present or have a correspondent bank, we endeavor to uh, establish strategic partnerships to be able to, to support in, uh, in, uh, in, in your business. Latin America is, of course, one of the countries where we are very committed to, to supporting uh, U.S. customers, and we have a very strong network in the, in, the, in the country. I have chosen today to focus on two particular countries, uh, Argentina and Brazil. So uh, if you could move the slide. Thank you. The first uh, country I want to talk about is Argentina. And unfortunately, the first bullet, Argentina is in default, is nothing unfamiliar. Uh, this is, as I counted, the ninth time since uh, its independence that Argentina is in default. To understand the last uh, default, uh, we have to go back to 2018 uh, and the uh, economic policies that the former president, Mr. Macri, implemented. Um, he did endeavor to uh, to, uh, to uh, rake in quite a bit of uh, fresh investments from foreign investors. Unfortunately for him and Argentina, the economic uh, economy never really picked up and he was forced to approach IMF, as Argentina has done before, for a new loan. This time, the largest one that IMF uh, has ever um, uh, dished out, it's a $56 billion loan. It was granted in 2018. But sadly, it did not have the intended effect and the economy never picked up even after this. You could say what really, really is pushed the latest default here uh, was the primary election in uh, August uh, 11th, 2019, where it became clear that Mr. Macri was uh, unlikely to regain or retain his presidency. And uh, Mr. Alberto Fernandez uh, from the Defender of the Todos uh, Party Won the won the primary election. This sparked uh, a um, a sell-off uh, of uh, Argentine Argentinian bonds, and they were trading at the time of 50 percent to the dollar. So that is really what kicked off the uh, the latest uh, default here. When Mr. Fernandez finally won the vote, of course, he needed to restructure the the economy, which brings me to the next point, the foreign debt negotiations, uh, which are, you could say, twofold. You have the local, uh, you could say threefold, sorry. You have the local negotiations, and then you have the IMF negotiations, and then what is proving particularly difficult at the moment is the foreign bondholders, where they have yet to reach an agreement. Before IMF will commit to, to any new loan or restructuring of the current uh, loan, where they still have a quite a big of, a, uh, of an outstanding, um, they are awaiting the, uh, the agreement with the foreign bondholders. Um, and that is understandable from my point that they do not want to interfere with that, uh, with that process. What I have seen recently is that the IMF have indicated that they do not believe that the foreign bondholders would get any better deal than what is being proposed at the moment, putting quite a bit of pressure on, on, um, on the foreign bondholders to actually uh, accept uh, the, the current proposal. Now, following that, um, 
what has recently happened is that the Argentinian stocks have risen a little bit. Uh, that could indicate uh, that an agreement is close. And uh, on Friday, it could potentially be when an agreement is reached. Nothing is sure. The deadline has been pushed so many times now that no one can actually, uh, uh, no one actually would believe it before they actually see it. Once that uh, negotiation has been uh, has been has been handled, and then we move on to the restructuring of the IMF loan. And the latest uh, I have seen is that um, the uh, the uh, government, uh, Mr. Martin Guzman, uh, from from the Argentinian government, has stated that they are looking or hoping for an agreement where they would be uh, interest free. Or, uh, free of for paying interest in the next three years. So it is an extremely, extremely difficult situation for um, for Argentina at the moment. Um, if you look at the banking outlook, it is it is very tricky for them. Uh, I think the both the, the the situation that we saw last year with the actual default and then with the coronavirus uh, on top of it has really proven to be um, a, very, very tricky. So if we look at the restructuring proposal um, um, and how that's going to impact it, I, I think it is fair to say that the outlook is very negative and uh, that um, that we are looking into uh, to a very contracted uh, economy in, in Argentina. There are quite a few banks in, in, in the country. Uh, there is around 70, but many of them are rather small. Uh, we, of course, as Nodea, we endeavor to, to keep options open uh, for the time being. We are monitoring this very heavily and we are continuously talking also to uh, Finbi in, in Sweden, oh, sorry, in Finland uh, as, a, as a, also a close partner and EKF, of course, uh, in, in Denmark. Um, we are committed to, uh, to the region, we are committed to Argentina and we hopefully, uh, will, hopefully we will soon see a, a an agreement whereby we can then continue to analyze how uh, we can support uh, our customers in the country. Moving on to Brazil, as Amy touched upon, uh, Brazil has been heavily hit by, by COVID-19. Uh, already before that, it, it, the, the economy was not doing particularly well. And now with this this uh, situation now, it has gone from, from, from bad to worse. Um, that is very closely linked to the to the political environment, which uh, it is fair to say is very tumultuous. Um, the it did start positively when uh, when President uh, Bolsonaro came into uh, came into to power. He um, managed to uh, to uh, get a, and the pension performed uh, um, through the through the Congress, which was a huge victory for him and uh, and. Uh, very surprising that that actually did, did, did come into force. Now, with the COVID-19 virus, unfortunately, it, it seems like that uh, both uh, both um, the uh, federal Senate and also the very powerful senators in the, in the local in the states, they are at odds with uh, with uh, with um, uh, President Bolsonaro, and uh, they have a very hard time on, on agreeing on anything. The latest I have seen, uh, except for the very high th death tolls and uh, infection cases, is that they are now uh, moving towards a blackout in actually publishing the numbers as there are disagreements on which numbers are actually correct. So a very difficult situation politically as well for Brazil. Um, if we move on to the banking sector, uh, it is a very large uh, financial system, a lot of banks, I count 138 uh, of you could say the 10 largest uh, perhaps um, take up around 80% of the total assets in the, in the banking sector. Again here, it is a, a country that we are committed to both now and have also been historically. We have a very strong network in the country uh, and we will continue to do so. Of course, this situation now in the economy, we are monitoring which banks to um, that, uh, that we will continue to work with, and uh, we expect that uh, that we uh, are um, that we will see the the larger banks in the country being uh, uh, being our closest partners in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, we continue by Peter. So your turn, please. Hello and good morning. Um, 
I will talk a little bit. Uh, an outset would be Argentina and Brazil, but it will I will touch up on uh, Latin America and compare to other regions. And one of the regions that I will compare have some comparisons will uh, will be Africa. They also have had some similarities historically. So uh, therefore, you can take the next slide. Therefore, I will continue with them. And to begin this. Um, comparison I, I i want to highlight uh, first of all one huge difference between africa and latin america and that if you go to the bottom middle um, of the slide where you can see the uh, the public debts uh, the red is of course alarmingly high public debts uh, brazil uh, is having over i think it's close to 95 percent of gdp in public debts and to the uh, right of the world map of pub, uh, illustrating the public debt uh, there are some graphs on the uh, private debt and that is a huge change uh, if, uh, difference be, between the public debt and the private debts for instance argentina uh, is one of the lowest in these uh, also brazil has below the uh, emerging market average if you compare to the very, very highly private debt uh, countries such as um, Canada, Korea, the UK, and the United States, for instance, that are way over uh, 8% and over the average of the OECD countries. So there is another huge difference uh, that will impact the future, and that is the uh, population growth. Population growth is one of the factors to, to uh, drive an economy forward and economic growth. And uh, the picture on the, um, the, the world map illustrating the world's population at the year 2100. Uh, today, we'll have 1 billion, uh, if you look at 2020, there will be 1 billion in the Americas, 1 billion in the Europe and uh, uh, Russia region, 1 billion in Africa, and 4 billion in Asia, which is illustrated by the yellow. Uh, by 2100, Asia will grow by 1 billion, and the growth will not be driven by, by uh, families having more than two children, which is even today, uh, the norm in most of the world. It will be driven in Asia by uh, an age increase that they will actually live longer and the child deaths will be decreasing. The population growth is not estimated to grow at all in the Americas, uh, nor will it grow in Europe or Russia. But in Africa, that's where we'll have a huge population growth, driven both by uh, families having more than two children and the, the life expectancy span. So we'll go from 1 billion to 4 billion. Uh, now this slide was, yeah. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, uh, an optimistic view of something that will drive the economy. But it will also have challenges in Africa. There's a very young population. The, the, the average age is, age is, it seems to be, yeah. Um, the average age is the lowest in the world of all continents and that of course creates opportunities but it creates a lot of challenges uh, if you keep uh, this population unemployed it will be uh, definitely an unrest and consequences politically uh, we can go to the next slide And that is the trading partner and the change in trading partners. Uh, it's been a, a dramatic change just within the last 20 years. Uh, if you look at, to the left-hand side, you see that Africa has gone from formally traded with their uh, former colonial powers, uh, and China has been very successful in, in uh, trading with Africa. And we also see a shift in Latin America, which United States have had a, a very strong hold on the trading, uh, being the, by far the largest trading partner in Latin America. That has shifted as well. And China has been, been quite successful lately. And if you see on the top left-hand corner, that's the map of, uh, of Brazil and different regions in Brazil. Uh, and you can see that China has been very successful in most regions and will, going forward, definitely be uh, um, a force a trading a 
trading partner force to be to to be counting on. If you go to the next slide, I will move on to how this will implement, uh, how this will, what impact it will have going forward. Because I think going forward we will have a different world, uh, not the least due to COVID-19, uh, which has already been touched up on by Jasper and Amy. The epicenter is Latin America now. And if without a doubt, uh, that will have an impact economically and socially. So the rating agencies have all given basically all countries in Latin America a negative outlook. If you compare that to other regions, uh, for instance, in this case, Africa, Africa already had such a low rating. So it, the impact will not be that dramatic due to COVID-19 or the economic consequences uh, globally that COVID-19 will have. But in Latin America, we definitely will see a, an impact in ratings. And ratings will have an impact on, on uh, the risk appetite, which I will touch upon uh, in a moment. There is an intensified political climate in, in Latin America. Uh, Bolsonaro definitely has a controversial uh, political agenda. Uh, you have Venezuela and we have, of course, the financial crisis in Argentina that will definitely leave tracks uh, in the political environment in Argentina. How this plays out will have an impact on the future. The different outsets, uh, as we looked on the previous slides, we can see the public debt and the private debt varies from, from country to country in Latin America. Brazil being very heavily public debt and Argentina is in default already. How does this play out in comparison to what the foreign reserve is? What, what do they actually have for, in resources. Well, Argentina and Brazil actually do have some foreign exchange and Latin America as a continent have some resources uh, to fall back on in comparison to Africa. As you can see, there's only Morocco, South Africa and Egypt and Mauritius that actually have any foreign reserve to even talk about. And having Nigeria being the largest economy with no foreign reserves, uh, that is quite alarming uh, going forward into 2021. They have different needs as well. Uh, if you look at the Latin American economies and, and historically the infrastructure is far well developed. They are importing machinery as already said. Compared to Africa, there are still uh, very basic needs. They're importing food. Uh, the importing recycled paper, the importing very basic goods and their infrastructure is uh, only available in the major cities. If you go on the, on the rural areas, uh, it's very poor infrastructure, which basically eliminates all possibilities of transports uh, within the continent. And this of course has an impact on the risk appetites. Uh, Africa, has always had a poor risk appetite, while Latin America has had a pretty strong risk appetite from financial institutions, ECAs, and private risk insurers. That has changed a little bit in the past year and will change going forward. We have seen that private risk insurances are uh, quite difficult to get in Latin America, and it's virtually impossible in Africa. Uh, the bank's risk appetite is still okay in Latin America, while it's being scarce in in, uh, in a continent like Africa, for instance. The banking system in Africa is of course much, much smaller compared to Latin America. Latin American banks are larger and a little bit uh, better uh, liqu liquid, uh, liquid. And this will bring us to a changed behavior. Um, how will banks and how will ECAs and private risk insurers behave in the future with these um, compliance uh, constraints that we have uh, and also the changing risk uh, due to rating, due to financial situations and, and due to the uh, behavior of customers. We have seen a small change so far, but I predict this change will increase going forward. 
customers that uh, historically has traded on open accounts seems to be looking for risk cover these days. They seem to be going towards collections or LCs. Customers that historically traded on collections that has been financed definitely are moving to LCs. Uh, the trade volumes, however, of course, have decreased during this epidemic crisis that we have experienced in 2020. Uh, but going forward, I think the risk behavior will change from the customer, but also from institutions that are covering the risk. So uh, we are in a need of a transparent dialogue going forward to be able to um, walk our customers, you in this case, through these difficult times uh, in a safe manner. The population growth, which is the, my last bullet point, is, for instance, in Latin America, not going to be driven. The economic growth will not be driven by the population growth. So it has to be driven by increased trade. As Amy was also talking about, uh, they need to have an increased middle class will drive the economy forward. While in Africa, the population growth will be driving the economic need forward. Um, I think I stopped there because I think time has been, we need some questions for time for, uh, we need some time for Q and A's as well. Thank you very much, Peter. And then uh, the last presenter today is Jana. So please. Good morning. I will talk about trap cash, how to avoid trap cash, and if there are any solutions uh, which can help us if money are, if you have idle cash in the regulated restricted re jurisdiction. So on the next slide, I, um, I will start uh, to talk about the financial markets in general. The majority on Latin America financial markets is heavily regulated. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and I can continue. First, resident companies can only trade with resident banks under the supervision of local central banks and other authorities. So it means, for example, if you operate via subsidiary Argentina, your Argentinian company can only trade with Argentinian bank and Argentinian bank, uh, it can be, for example, subsidiary of the global bank. So it will be, a, 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 even uh, it's a part of the global bank, it will be bank operating under the rules of the Argentina and follow uh, and under the Argentinian uh, sovereign rating. Non-resident banks, that is, for example, Nodea, we do not have a subsidiary in Argentina, can have access to local markets via their non-resident Vostro accounts, which will be, of course, with the authorized banks, with the local banks. And if it is not allowed, then the banks can operate via local subsidiaries, which then hold the local banking licenses. What is uh, valid for all Latin American uh, financial markets is that all cross-border flows is closely monitored and reported to local authorities. And then you can ask why all these regulations and restrictions and I will say it is all about the money. The local authorities, they protect the current account. They try to keep a positive balance, which they unfortunately do not have all. They protect local banks and they are managing the local currency via these restrictions and regulations. And Argentina is a good example. Shortage of money implies heavy restrictions on repatriation. And of course, you are doing business in uh, this difficult jurisdiction and you make business decision where you expect rewards outweigh the potential risks. But it's so important to consider the entire setup to minimize all risks to ensure the revenues. And if I use uh, Argentina as an example, I will say when you can choose as a country party a bank outside the troubled regulated jurisdiction when it is possible. I still remember the default in 2001 when I spoke to companies and they um, explained to me, we are safe, we are not afraid of the devaluation. Um, <clears throat> we have a dollar deposit or we do have a, we do have a contract, a hedging contract uh, with a global bank. What happened is 
again, the local subsidiary had a contract with the subsidiary. So again, um, following the, the local regulations, dollar deposit was on account with the wrong bank because it was a bank, again, in Argentinian jurisdiction. So when they default, all the contracts clearing was suspended and money were trapped for a while. Nodea, and I, why I'm using Nodea name is because I can only talk about our setup, how we work, and about my experience, because banks have a different setups. We work via Vostra accounts in Latin America, not unfortunately in Argentina, and via financial instruments in Latin American currencies. And here we can we create various solutions uh, to mitigate country party risk, to mitigate risk of trapped cash. And of course, we do focus on transparency and efficiency. On the next slide, I will talk briefly about Argentina because Argentina is in troubles. It is a hot topic. And they have implemented series of restrictions to avoid capital flows. Exporters, they have to repatriate their, their fixed uh, uh, earnings there are deadlines, uh, there is a general rule how the importers can access uh, a fixed market and buy US dollar to pay for the import. What is actually slightly good is that in October 2019, import financing was, um, um, was um, taken out uh, from the financial uh, financing, but there are regulations on important financing still better than uh, financial financing. Bad thing is that uh, uh, local authorities again monitor uh, uh, import payments. Um, in January this year, there was some relaxation, so companies could repatriate some profits, but there was a cap of 30% of uh, invested uh, FX in the country. And that's again uh, bringing me back. If you if you want to be sure on the repatriation, or remember when you are entering in country to have all the registrations to be able to repatriate. And in May, recently, uh, central bank implement some restrictions on FX. Uh, so if company would like to reduce their debt, um, <clears throat> there are regulations how to do that. Um, Offshore market for hedging, because this regulation is about repatriation or cross-border payments. Offshore market for hedge instruments still work. We did have a disruption, but it works. I took the price, uh, how to buy US dollar uh, via non-deliverable forward. It's higher, uh, um, but when I wrote it, uh, spot was around 69. Uh, one year contract was 120. It's actually higher, it's 140, implying 100% uh, cost of hedge. It was mentioned Argentina talked to creditors. Um, deadline is Friday. Um, let's see if they don't uh, if they don't reach agreement and they don't uh, agree to continue negotiations. Of course, there will be even more trapped cash. On the next slide, uh, briefly about Brazil, another heavily regulated jurisdiction. But here it is uh, it is easier to repatriate. Uh, it is possible. Nodea operates via Vostro account, so we can help companies to invest in Brazil, help uh, with the payments, Brazilian REI payments, into local accounts, including the appropriate registrations. So you are sure that when you are repatriating, you have all in place. Country is not easy. It is as well uh, difficult. And what I find mostly difficult is the taxation. Um, Again, really important to make your homework. The taxation is heavy, and I know about a lot of trapped cash because of the dispute on tax. I know about uh, the financial tax, uh, which is currently, for example, uh, when you buy Brazilian REI, the tax is 0 0.38. When you are selling REI, the tax is 1.1% of the principal. The intercompany loan are taxed. And there is a difference what tax is paid, whether you, you do the payment Brazilian payment with the non-resident bank or if you choose local bank. We as a non-resident bank always pay 38, 0.38%. On the other hand, we are not. you will not be taxed if you do the hedge instruments because we are not paying the IOF tax on the hedge instruments which other local banks are doing. Of course, there are a lot of exemptions. It's always in the regulated restricted jurisdictions. So really important to make your homework. And there are bright spots. It's a Peru. We operate as well via uh, uh, via uh, 
a clearing account, we can help with money in and out. It works. On the next slide, um, I just brought very quickly Mexico, big financial markets. Uh, it is as well regulated, but it's possible to move money in and out. And I just make a drawings to show how to get idle cash from the regulated and low rated jurisdiction. And it was mentioned several times, Latin America has a tough time. So uh, having idle cash in BBB rating, it's always good to make intercompany loan. So you don't build the, the, the balance in, the, in such a country, take the idle cash home, use them. For example, in Nodea, you can open Mexico account, make uh, move the money from the BBB rating country into double A bank, and uh, then you can use the money. And again, they can be easily repaid back when your subsidiary needs them. And I have to stop, it's 9.45, I can't say any more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jana, and, and thanks, Amy, Jesper, and Peter, too, for your presentations. Uh, we have time for one question, so I, I picked up uh, one a more generic one. Uh, this one is for you, Jesper. Uh, many Nordic banks seem to modify their correspondent bank networks, which often has meant fewer banks in the network. Do you see this continuing in the future too? Uh, yes, you can say from, from uh, us in Nordea, we've been doing this work uh, continuously uh, for, for the last few years, and uh, this is something that will continue. Of course, there will be a, a keen focus on, on being able to deliver the, the best service to our customers. Uh, so definitely from, from our point of view, we, we do see this as a continuing trend, how and, and uh, how it will be done and uh, kind of the rate of it uh, is, um, is of course something that we will, uh, we will continuously uh, discuss. Um, we also know that from our other large correspondent bank partners that they are doing the same. So everyone is, is in the same boat and um, much of it is driven by cost, uh, so KYC compliance costs. Uh, that is really one of the driving forces behind it. I, I will say that even though we are reducing our banking network, um, that uh, where we will then not have a correspondent bank, as I briefly mentioned in the start, that is where we will uh, endeavor or explore the possibility of uh, establishing regional uh, partnerships, uh, strategic partnerships, so we can actually continue to, to support uh, our customers. Thanks, Jesper. Uh, at the end, uh, I would just uh, like to uh, uh, remind you that we all in order are here to help you and, and that you're always welcome to, to contact us via your trade finance advisor or via any other of your Nordea contacts. And by doing that, uh, we can address your specific questions, whether they are related to certain regions or countries or, or banks in the world, or if they apply to practices on handling trade finance or any other products and, and solutions we are providing. So please feel free to use that opportunity. Thank you very much for participating in our webinar today. Wishing you all a very good day. Thank you.